preparations were completed here at KSC's payload processing facilities, assembling the telescopes, performing the proper testing and the checkout. The three telescopes uh, include the Hopkins Ultraviolet Telescope developed at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. The Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope developed by NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland and the Wisconsin Ultraviolet Photopolarimeter Experiment developed at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. The simultaneous observations by the three telescopes will complement one another. Even before Discovery landed, the next shuttle, Endeavour, was rolled out to the Kennedy Space Center launch complex. Its date with history will come the first week in March. It is the oldest science, and it is, in many ways, the most accessible to people with no scientific training. It is astronomy. With a clear night, a little luck, and some basic knowledge, it can be pursued as an avocation from just about anywhere. This week, we begin a new monthly feature aimed at people who like to aim for the stars in their spare time. We call it Backyard Universe, and our journey through it begins with Mars. The Romans named it after their god of war, but right now Mars will surrender its secrets peacefully if you point a telescope in its direction. It jumps right out at you. It's, it's a bright red, the brightest, most orangish object in the sky. Our guide through the backyard universe is astronomer Lucy McFadden. She says now is a good time to see Mars from our perch in the solar system. Earth is sandwiched perfectly between the red planet and the sun. It's an alignment called opposition. You can observe Mars actually all night during, during opposition, just like the moon during a full moon, the moon is up all night. Now we've got full Mars, Mars is up all night. Opposition happens every two years, but some are better than others. Right now, Earth and Mars are as far apart as they get, about 63 million miles. In eight years, Mars will be nearly twice as close. Still, this time around, backyard astronomers have a good chance of seeing the planet's polar caps and the constantly changing dark features. If you look and you don't see any features and it's a clear night, there could well be a dust storm that has stirred up all the dust and is obscuring the, the bedrock, the dark bedrock that's beneath it. Before astronomers figured that out, many thought the changing dark features of Mars were signs of vegetation on a living planet. But the US Viking landers, which touched down on the red planet in 1976, found no evidence of life. Still, astronomers are intrigued by Mars' massive dormant volcanoes, a canyon the size of the United States, and what appear to be dry riverbeds. There's a certain mystique associated with Mars. Um, people have always been sort of fascinated by the red planet. Why? It's not that far away from us in terms of cosmological scales. So it's actually, it's close to home. So I think as humans, the Mars mystique is, is there because it's, it's a lot like the Earth, but yet it's away from the Earth. Mars shouldn't be hard to find, even with the naked eye. During a clear evening, face to the east, find the moon, and then look down and left. By midnight, Mars will be directly overhead. The planet sets in the west in the morning. Just find the reddish star, and you'll be seeing the closest thing to Earth astronomers have found out of this world. Well, now that we've piqued your interest in the planet next door, hopefully, you may wonder what professional scientists are doing to learn more about it. Turns out, plenty. They are working on some Mars landers for NASA, which are much cheaper than previous space probes. That has engineers pinching pennies and collecting trash. Dan Brett spends a lot of time picking up feathers, paint flecks, and cigarette butts. For this, he went to grad school and got a PhD. I guess it takes a PhD to do maintenance on, uh, on Mars. Brett's little piece of Mars can be found in a small courtyard at the University of Arizona where engineers are testing a type of camera which is red planet bound in November of 96. What we're trying to do is to exercise ourselves and be able to recognize the possibilities of things that we might see on the, on the surface. To make this Mars garden, Britt and his colleagues tested 40 different shades of ground cover and gathered volcanic rocks like those which litter the surface of Mars from the surface of central Arizona. This is a very low cost Mars garden. <laughs> And the cost of the project was nearly zero. Project director Peter Smith says that is in keeping with the philosophy of this project. They are developing the camera for NASA's Pathfinder spacecraft, slated to reach the Martian surface in July of 1997. 
The entire project has a budget of $150 million, a pittance by NASA standards. The Mars Observer spacecraft, which failed two years ago as it approached the planet, cost a billion dollars. You trade off cost with risk. So we're accepting more risk with this mission than we might otherwise accept if we had a billion dollars to spend and could do more testing and could design in with better parts and, and uh, spend more time uh, developing our system. If successful, Pathfinder will land on Mars 21 years after a pair of U.S. spacecraft, Viking 1 and 2, sent back the first images from two locations on the rocky, barren surface. Imagine trying to make some sweeping conclusions about our planet based on the exploration of two small sites. Besides, Pathfinder is headed to a part of Mars which should have different geology than the Viking landing locations. So as accurate as this Mars garden may be, scientists are hoping they will see some things they did not predict. And even with its bare bones budget, Pathfinder should literally go beyond the Viking mission. Pathfinder will carry an 11-pound Martian rover. The autonomous robot will chisel rocks, collect soil, and expand horizons for scientists interested in learning more about Mars. Pathfinder is the first in a series of robotic Mars landers NASA plans to launch in the next decade. The new approach now is to fly more missions and to allow some to fail. And if you accept that risk, then you're not disappointed. You say, well, it's okay, this one mission failed, but we got three others that are going, and they're all interesting missions. The missions could lay the groundwork for a manned journey to Mars one day. It's enough incentive to keep Dan Britt on top of his groundwork. Links en rechts van die brandstoftank zien we die twee grote opduwraketten. Ja, daar had ik ook nog een vraag over. Uh, hoeveel kilo stuwkracht heeft de Space Shuttle nodig om omhoog te komen? Ja, je hebt gelijk, die waren we bijna vergeten. Door alle commotie, alle opwinding, bijna de tweede vraag vergeten. Maar hij is wel belangrijk, toch? Ja, daar gaat het natuurlijk wel om. Die stuwkracht is niet onbelangrijk. Uh, wat er daar staat, met brandstof en al, weegt 750 ton. En aan stuwkracht van die twee opduwraketten, maar ook van de eigen motoren van de shuttle, is er 3000 ton. Zo. Dus dat dus is behoorlijk wat meer. 3 miljoen kilo, kilo. Stuwkracht. stuwkracht. Had ja. je dat gedaan? Nee, een beetje veel. Een beetje veel, ja. ja. Ik had het ook niet gedacht, hoor. Nou, we hebben ontzettend veel geluk, want op dit moment uh, is de service structuur, de mobiele service toeren, die de shuttle tot nu toe afdekte. Die, die grijze deur die ervoor ja, zat, hè? Ja. Uh, bezig om open te draaien. En dat zal ongeveer een half uur duren. Zie je? Ja. Daar zit hij. Zie je, dan ziet hij ook het, uh, het vliegtuig zie je nu zitten. De vleugel. Het en het zwart met wit. Het herkenbare van de space shuttle. Ja. Nou, en links hiervan zie je die hele grote tank staan. Daar zit dus uh, vloeibare waterstof in. Voor de eigen motoren van het ruimtevliegtuig. Ja. Aan de andere kant staat nog zo'n tank en daar zit de vloeibare zuurstof in. En via leidingen wordt dat naar, naar de grote bruine tank van de, de Space Shuttle gebracht. Nou, nou is die uh, service structuur die is nu helemaal teruggedraaid naar achteren toe. We zien de Space Shuttle prachtig vrij staan. We zien ja. die grote roodbruine tank, die twee opduwers. Ja, en die tank die moet nou gevuld worden met 2 miljoen liter vloeibare waterstof en vloeibare zuurstof. Dit is een bekend beeld van de televisie, de lanceercontrolekamer. Hier wordt de gezondheid van de Space Shuttle al weken van tevoren tot en met de lancering heel nauwkeurig in de gaten gehouden. Dus zo'n 200 mensen die natuurlijk voornamelijk afgaan op computers, want je kunt dat niet allemaal gewoon zo zelf bekijken. Ja. En uh, dat gebeurt dus uh, terwijl die mensen, de meeste ervan, met hun rug naar de Space Shuttle toe zitten en allemaal gewoon op schermpjes zitten te kijken. Piet, het is nu ongeveer tien voor tien, zo'n drie uur voor de lancering van de Space Shuttle. Het wordt steeds spannender, maar wat gaat er nu hier gebeuren? Nou, hier staat de astronautenbus klaar. Binnen in dit gebouw zitten de astronauten. Die hebben daar tien dagen lang al een afzondering gezeten van de rest van de wereld. Ja. Want ze mogen natuurlijk niet besmet worden of iets dergelijks. Stel je voor dat de lancering zou moeten worden uitgesteld. Of nog erger, als ze eenmaal in de baan op de aarde zijn, dus ze zouden ziek worden. Dan zou de vlucht moeten worden bekocht. Dat kan natuurlijk niet. We zullen zo meteen naar buiten komen, vijf mannen en twee vrouwen in de bus stappen en wegrijden naar de lanceerplaats op een paar kilometer afstand. Een bijzonder moment. Ik denk het wel, ja.
Blazen Paul, onze helden. Ik moet, ik moet eerlijk zeggen, ik zou er veel geld voor over hebben om niet naar boven te hoeven gaan. Maar voor jou geldt het anders, of niet? Ja. Jij zou wel willen, hè? Ik denk dat wij uh, nu naar de plek moeten, hè? Lijkt mij ook. Ja, de klok staat nu op min 26 minuten voor de lancering van de Space Shuttle Endeavour. Ja. Er kan natuurlijk nog van alles gebeuren, tot op het moment van lancering. Maar laten we het beste van hopen. En ik zou voorstellen, laten we naar een goede, donkere plek gaan aan de rand van het meertje. Ja, dat vind ik een goed idee. Lijkt me een goed idee. Paul, ja? het is eigenlijk heel bijzonder, hè? 24 uur geleden zaten we nog op je slaapkamertje en nu staan we hier in Florida. 26 minuten voor de lancering van de Space Shuttle. Het heeft veel indruk op je gemaakt tot nu toe, hè? Dat hebben we kunnen doen. Maar het gaat nu gebeuren, wij gaan vlug naar die plek. Ja? Oké, okay. okay. we gaan. En je watching live pictures right now. Stay tuned. This is John Holloman. The countdown for the Space Shuttle Endeavour's record-breaking space flight is continuing Bad weather in Florida in the past several hours threatened the on-time launch, but launch director Bob Seek, who is famous for finding holes in low-lying clouds, has told his launch team they can send the shuttle on its way. What you see now in our live picture is a dome over the top of the liquid fuel tank for the shuttle being removed. The countdown now about three minutes from launch. The shuttle was scheduled to leave the Earth at about 37 minutes past the hour. Now NASA managers have told the crew that will probably be an extra minute, perhaps 38 minutes after. Good luck on your record-setting 16-day mission. That's a word from mission managers to the crew. We'll close them and start the flow. And in fact, Mr. Tulane has closed the London Ocean spaceship. And Dr. Holly doesn't have space on yet, but you have to put it on now. Yeah, let's go for ETLH2 pressurization. The crew confirming they got to work. 40 seconds and counting. One minute, 40 seconds and counting down to the launch of the shuttle Endeavour. The crew of two women and five men will One spend 16 seconds. days in orbit. One minute, 30 seconds. Using ultraviolet telescopes to study the moon around the Earth and distant stars and galaxies as well. The goals of this mission are many, All but the main reason Endeavor for putting Argo. ultraviolet sensitive telescopes into orbit is that they might be able to see stars that can't be seen by visible light telescopes. Never be launched on an easterly trajectory in an orbit inclined 28.45 degrees to the equator. On some recent shuttle launches, the uh, spaceship has taken off up the east coast of the and United T States one minute. so that it would be visible to, uh, to viewers in the United States. This particular launch, mark, the shuttle will travel almost due east and won't be visible much functions. out of the area around the state of Florida unless you're in Africa, where the shuttle will be flying over just a couple of minutes after launch. We're now 40 seconds from, uh, from launch of the shuttle Endeavour, and during the last 30 seconds, as we always do, we'll let you listen to the final 30 seconds of the countdown. Yeah, let's go for auto sequence start. 25, 24, 23, 2, 1. Thousands of gallons of water will be dumped onto the launch platform in the next few seconds. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. We have a go for main engine start. 4, 3, 2, 1. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour on a voyage to view the universe. Houston now controlling. Roll program, Houston. Roger roll, Endeavour. 
roll maneuver underway aboard Endeavour. The vehicle's now in a heads-down position on course for a 20, 28 and a half degree orbit. engines have now throttled down as the orbiter passes through the area of maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle in the lower atmosphere. Endeavour's already two miles downrange from the launch site, traveling more than 1,000 miles per hour. Endeavour Houston, go at throttle up. The three liquid-fueled engines are back at full throttle aboard Endeavour. At the 1 minute 30 second mark, Endeavour is traveling 1,700 miles per hour. The altitude is 82,000 feet downrange from the launch site, 12 nautical miles. Standing by for burnout and separation of the twin solid rocket boosters. As we watch the, uh, the last few seconds of this part of the mission, let me tell you a little bit about the crew. There go the two solid rocket boosters. They have just about burned out, and they are separating from the shuttle. Now what you see in the center NSRB of the screen, the three uh, main engines. Aboard Endeavour at the 2 minute 15 second mark. The vehicle is at an altitude of 178,000 feet, downrange from the launch site, 38 nautical miles. Endeavour is now traveling 4,500 feet per second, or 3,000 miles per hour. You, you just heard the voice of Commander Steve Oswald, who told Houston that performance of the shuttle is nominal. He's the commander. He's from Washington State, and after graduating from the Naval Academy in the United States, he became a test pilot. Endeavour can now reach uh, Ben Gurir in Morocco in the event of a single engine failure. He's been an astronaut for about 10 years and has been in space twice before this trip. His pilot is Bill Gregory from New York. He graduated from the Air Force Academy. He's been a fighter pilot and instructor pilot before joining the Air Force Test Pilot School. This is his first trip into space. Wendy Lawrence is the flight engineer. She's a Naval Academy graduate and pilot who was distinguished flight school grad from her school. She's a helicopter pilot. The payload crew includes Tammy Jernigan from Chattanooga, Tennessee. She has a PhD in space physics from Rice University. Mission specialist John Grunsfeld from Chicago and has a PhD in physics from the University of Chicago. His job on the mission to maintain the telescopes and the pointing equipment that helps keep them looking at the right direction. Final two crew members are the astronomers who will operate the telescopes. Ron Paris and Sam Durantz have been working on the ultraviolet telescopes in the cargo bay for more than 10 years. As you can see in the middle of your screen, the main engine's continuing to work properly for the Space Shuttle Endeavour mission. Looks like this launch has been virtually picture perfect. For CNN and CNN International, I'm John Holloman. Approaching uh, the four minute point in Endeavour's. T minus 20 seconds. Thousands of gallons of water will be dumped onto the launch platform in the next few okay, seconds. Okay, now what it is echt spannend. What we have we noch? 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. We have a go for main engine start. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour on a voyage to view the universe. Houston now controlling. Roger roll, Endeavour. Goeiemorgen. Oh, roll maneuver underway aboard Endeavour. The vehicle's now in a heads down position on course for a 20, 28 and a half degree. Endeavour's engines have now throttled down as the orbiter passes through the area of maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle in the lower atmosphere. Fantastic, eh? We're going to go two minutes to the start. 
afstoten van de vaste brandstofraketten links en rechts van de tank. En ongeveer een minuut of vijf, zes later is hij in een baan op de aarde, de Endeavour. Voor de langste vlucht van een shuttle. Namelijk 16 dagen. Oh jongens, ongelooflijk. Echt een mooie dag. Take two. Fantastisch. Dat dacht ik ook. Nou, tenslotte verdwijnt hij als een heldere ster tussen de sterren die langzamerhand weer aan de hemel verschijnen. Four, three, two. Booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour on a voyage to view. Found a clearing in the cloudy sky, and the shuttle Endeavour blasted into the night. During the 15 and a half day mission, the longest ever for a shuttle, astronauts will study the mysteries of the universe. The seven member crew will use ultraviolet telescopes to study the Earth's moon and distant stars and galaxies. Endeavour is to its bisher longest mission gestartet. Mit an Bord sind diesmal drei Astronautinnen. Diesmal kein Traumstart im sonst sonnigen Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Die Endeavour startete durch ein Loch in der Wolkendecke. Der 68. Flug wird 15 Tage und 13 Stunden dauern. In der Raumfähre sind insgesamt sieben Astronauten, davon vier Astrophysiker. Der Zweck des Raumfluges ist, mehr über die Entstehung von Sonnen und Planeten herauszufinden. An Bord sind fünf Männer und zwei Frauen, die 15 Tage im All bleiben sollen. Der bislang längste Flug einer amerikanischen Raumfähre dient der astronomischen Forschung. Drei Ultraviolett-Teleskope sollen Einblicke in weit entfernte Galaxien möglich machen. Von den Beobachtungen erhoffen sich die Wissenschaftler weiteren Aufschluss über die Entstehung von Sonnen und Planeten und über die Entwicklung des Universums. Richteten die Astronauten die drei Ultraviolett-Teleskope aus. Mit ihnen wollen sie in die Tiefen des Weltalls blicken und neue Erkenntnisse über die Entstehung des Universums gewinnen. Eine Wunschliste mit 600 Sternen haben die vier Astrophysiker an Bord dabei. Rund um die Uhr werden sie in zwölf Stundenschichten arbeiten, bevor es am 17. März wieder zurück auf die Erde geht. Planned two week mission, astronauts are having trouble pointing the ultraviolet telescopes. Crew members had to aim one of the three instruments manually Friday. The telescopes are designed to lock automatically on their targets using a computer. NASA says ground crews have resolved most of the problem. Endeavour is scheduled to observe more than 600 targets, ranging from the moon to distant galaxies and quasars. Die Astronauten der Endeavour hatten schon nach nur zwei Tagen im All technische Probleme mit der Software in ihrer Teleskopsteuerung. Die Plattform, auf der das Teleskop befestigt ist, gibt derart nach, dass die Sterne in einer Richtung aus dem Sichtfeld des Teleskops driften. Genau dieses Problem ist schon bei vorherigen Flügen aufgetreten. Die NASA hatte im Vorfeld dieser Mission 45 Millionen Dollar für die Behebung dieses Steuerungsproblems ausgegeben. Two astronauts had to manually point Endeavour's ultraviolet telescopes after a computerized pointing system failed. The telescopes are supposed to lock onto their targets automatically, but ended up drifting instead. Ground controllers are trying to fix the problem. On Saturday, the telescopes managed to zero in on the remnants of a supernova. The computer this weekend and are sending back ultraviolet images of the largest planet in our solar system along with three of Jupiter's moons. The pictures show from left to right the moons Europa, Ganymede, and Io, with Jupiter obvious on the right. Astronomer Regina Schulte says she's seen things she never expected. This is so wonderful because ever since I was a kid, I wanted to do astronomy. And, you know, I'm, I'm a child of the moon landing. I could see um, the moon landing uh, in my home country in Germany in the middle of the night on television. And I really got hooked on astronomy then. And, you know, being here, observing with the space shuttle is for me the nearest best thing to being an astronaut and really being out there. Payload Commander Tammy Jernigan told a National Public Radio interviewer about the things she and her crewmates are looking for. Well, we're looking for a variety of things. Um, the instruments on board, we have uh, three instruments and we do things like 
take spectra and measure polarization and do imaging of various objects, everything ranging from nearby planets to distant galaxies. Um, one of the objects we looked at today was uh, Io, which is one of Jupiter's moons. And we just have a variety of, of objects to look at in the universe, and we're studying everything from uh, local planetary phenomena, like the volcanoes that uh, we see on Io, and also uh, star formation and evolution of the galaxy. And the Wendy Lawrence is steering the shuttle toward objects for the telescope to bring in. Uh, in order to acquire the data, we have to do a large number of maneuvers, so in some ways I'm... I'm a bus driver. I'm in charge of making sure the vehicle is where it's supposed to be, when it's supposed to be there. And on the side, they get to uh, maintain it and clean it as well. Before leaving for the 16-day space odyssey, the astronauts all reported their biggest worry was going to be how well they'd be able to clean the spaceship. So far, so good. John Holloman, CNN reporting. Observations with these instruments. This is one of your hardest days, the astronauts. Oh, but there were so many of these days. It seemed to me... We were always going out and meeting Relatives families and, and seeing coffins come off of planes and it was terrible. Look at your face and Ron's face. Mm -hmm. No words necessary. No, it says it all. Everybody. with the latest from the shuttle Endeavour when we come back. CNN's John Holloman joins us with the latest on the interstellar work being done by Endeavour astronauts. John. You know something, Simeon, this, this quasar is 10 billion light years away. The guys at NASA gave me a thing in the, in the, uh, on a fax uh, today which said you take the, um, the number 10 and you add 24 zeros and that's how many miles away this quasar is and they've got it in their sights it's amazing yes right now the constellation Sagittarius is into Endeavour's field of view in an experiment designed to show scientists how two stars can orbit around each other the telescopes themselves working nearly perfectly as you pointed out lining up on targets one after another a question which scientists are trying to answer on this mission is whether the Big Bang really created the universe they zoomed in on this quasar 10 billion light years away to try to answer that question they don't have the answer yet but they say maybe by the end of this 14 or 16 day mission they'll have it the most impressive sight so far may be the pictures of Jupiter and two of its moons which came in yesterday here they are you can see the largest planet in our solar system on the right and three of its moons in orbit on the left the two women aboard Endeavour did an interview from the flight deck in which they talked about their work but also about their play uh, Tammy Jernigan and Wendy Lawrence say they look out the windows at the Earth, given any opportunity. We have a little bit of free time. Sometimes it competes with our sleep time. It's very hard to make yourself go to sleep when you have such a wonderful view of the Earth and the stars. Have you seen any? But, uh, between uh, observations or during some of the observations, because we do all our, um, we operate our instruments from the flight deck, sometimes it's just as simple as peeking up and taking a look out the overhead or aft windows of the space shuttle to get just an incredible view of the planet. All the astronauts talk about sunrise and sunset as being the most beautiful things they see from space. Here's one of the sunsets as Endeavour moved around the world. Since the shuttle orbits the Earth every 90 minutes, there's a chance to see a sunrise and a sunset 16 times a day. Somebody accused me of ignoring the non-women on board the shuttle. There are five men there, too, including payload specialist Ron Paris, Bill Gregory, and John Grunsfeld, who you can see there. These three men are working a 12-hour shift, while the women and two additional male astronauts work the opposite 12 hours. With hundreds of objects in space to look at, some crew members have to be awake and working at all times. One more thing we ought to talk about briefly, Simeon, something coming up nine days from today. A U.S. astronaut is in training at the Russian Launch Center to go up on a Russian rocket. First time an American has been on a Russian spaceship. He's going to go up to the Russian Mir space station, spend a couple of months there before being plucked off by a shuttle which will dock with the Mir in June. So the countdown for that mission is continuing to move right along today. Wow, that's awfully, awfully exciting. It really yeah. is. You know, uh, thank you so much for bringing such enthusiasm mm -hmm. to this and putting it in, in terms that, as a real layperson, I can even understand. Well, that's good. I mean, that's what I am, too. You know, you have to, you have to try to figure it out somehow if you can. But, <laughs> Simeon, it's good to be with you. Thank you, John. Be back throughout the mission. The shuttle Endeavour are visually roaming the universe using three onboard telescopes. The constellation Sagittarius was among the interstellar objects viewed Sunday. 
Astronomers are studying the interaction between the two stars in Sagittarius as they orbit one another. Stargazing. On Saturday, they zoomed in on a quasar, which appears to ground controllers as a tiny pinpoint of light, a mind-boggling... Of course, 60 sextillion miles. <laughs> CNN's John Holloman is here with the details. 60 sextillion. sextillion. So you start with 60 and you add 24 O's after that. So you know, that's what, it's a long way off. That and really the is. The fact that they can see it with this telescope is pretty dramatic. The scientists at the uh, uh, Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, are just, you know, they're going like this. They didn't think they'd ever get this thing in their sights, and the fact that they've got it is making them jump for joy. Uh, in fact, many of the pictures being taken by the telescopes are being recorded on film for development later. And the pictures sent live to the ground are from a TV camera inside the telescopes. So the pictures we're seeing today are nothing like as good as what we're going to be able to see in a couple of months when the, the photographic plates are developed. This is a star known to astronomers as an O-class in the Reflection Nebula, located in the constellation Auriga. The, the study of stars like this is made easier using ultraviolet telescopes which can see stars which send out ultraviolet radiation which can't be seen by the naked eye. Now here's what the star looks like in the center of your screen right now. The astronauts point out they can't tell initially if pictures like this are major discoveries or not. I think um, we'll certainly have indications when we see something of significance, but it takes some time for scientists to analyze their data and to look at it carefully and make sure that they're, they're seeing what they think they see when they make their initial interpretation. So it may be a few days before, or even a few weeks, before the scientists are really ready to come out and say for certain that they've seen a phenomenon that's new and unique, or that they think they understand something in a, in a more detailed way than they did before, because they want to be careful when they do their data analysis. The astronaut crews are uh, swapping shifts right now. One group is waking up, another uh, group is going to bed. The mission is scheduled to continue through March 17th when the astronauts will land at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Between now and then, they'll try to get as many as 600 different celestial targets into the sights on these telescopes. As always, John, intriguing, interesting, and we thank you all. You bet. When Andex bei München ist offenbar ein Meteorit auf die Erde gestürzt. Beim Aufprall in einem Sumpfgebiet entstand ein großer Krater, Richard Sonntag mit den Einzelheiten. Der Krater hat einen Durchmesser von 20 Metern und ist 8 Meter tief. Ein Zeichen, dass der Meteorit sehr groß gewesen sein muss. Ein Polizeihubschrauber flog heute zufällig über das Sumpfgebiet und entdeckte den Einschlag. Nur einen Kilometer von der oberbayerischen Gemeinde Andex entfernt. Großes Glück für die Anwohner. Wenn das Flugobjekt in Andex eingeschlagen hätte, wäre es mit Sicherheit äh, zu einer mittleren bis großen Katastrophe gekommen. In einem Umkreis von 200 Metern schmolzt der Schnee. Überall liegen große Schlammstücke herum. Aus Sorge, Weltraumschrott sei vom Himmel gefallen, führte die Feuerwehr radioaktive Messungen durch. Allerdings waren diese negativ. Dieser Krater hat einen Durchmesser von 20 Metern und ist rund 8 Meter tief. Ein Bauer hat das Ganze beobachtet. Es sei eine 150 Meter hohe Schlammfontäne aufgespritzt. Morgen wollen Experten klären, was sich wirklich in dem großen Loch verbirgt. Durch den Einschlag des glühend heißen Meteoriten sind Schlammbrocken bis zu 500 Meter weit geflogen. Im Umkreis von 200 Metern ist sogar der Schnee geschmolzen. Augenzeuge dieses seltenen Ereignisses, ein Landwirt. Ja, ich bin im, im Hof gestanden und dann hat es äh, an Richtung Andex einen dumpfen Knall da. Und dann schaue ich da über den Wald und... Äh, dann ist es eine Fontäne in Tee mit, mit Dreckbatzen und, und Wasser und Dampf und das war dann alles. Bauer Arndt dachte jedoch, es handle sich um eine Sprengung, also meldete er nichts der Polizei. Da der Grund des Kraters inzwischen mit Wasser vollgelaufen ist, kann man nur vermuten, dass der Himmelskörper ungefähr die Größe eines Fußballes hat. Wenn das Flugobjekt in Andex eingeschlagen hätte, wäre es mit Sicherheit äh, zu einer mittleren bis großen Katastrophe gekommen. Wenn man sich vorstellt, die Wucht des Einschlags, wie man vor Ort das gesehen hat, hätte leicht ein Haus vom Dach bis tief in den Keller durchschlagen. Inzwischen sind Geologen aus dem ganzen Bundesgebiet unterwegs, um den Einschlag zu untersuchen. Was entdeckte heute in der Nähe der oberbayerischen Ortschaft Andex einen riesigen Krater? Es deutet alles darauf hin, dass es sich um einen Meteorit 
Ein Landwirt hatte einen dumpfen Schlag gehört und eine 150 Meter hohe Schlammfontäne gesehen. Das Einschlagloch hat einen Durchmesser von 20 Meter und befindet sich mitten in einem Moorgebiet. Im weiten Umkreis des Kraters ist der Schnee geschmolzen. Schlammbrocken liegen überall verteilt. Die Gegend gleicht einer Mondlandschaft. Wie Sie vorher selber gesehen haben, war die Wucht des Einschlags so groß, das hätte auch spinnleicht ein Haus vom Dach bis tief in den Keller rein durchschlagen. Vorsorglich wurden von der Feuerwehr radioaktive Messungen durchgeführt, weil man zunächst dachte, dass es sich um Weltraumschrott handeln könnte. Die Messungen waren jedoch negativ. Nun werden sich die Geologen um diesen seltenen Absturz des Himmelskörpers kümmern. Heute ist der vierte Tag der Endeavour-Mission und die Teleskope brachten die ersten spektakulären Bilder zur Erde. Ein Blick in die unendlichen Weiten des Weltalls. Das Licht dieses Sternenobjekts, das die Teleskope hier einfangen, ist bereits 10 Milliarden Lichtjahre unterwegs. Mit ihrem 200 Millionen Dollar teuren Teleskop beobachten die Wissenschaftler vor allem die ultraviolette Strahlung, um mehr über die Entstehung des Universums zu erfahren. Am Ende ihres Shuttlefluges nach 15 Tagen und 13 Stunden werden die Astronomen mehr als 460 Sternenobjekte beobachtet haben. Der kreisrunde Krater von 20 Metern Durchmesser bei Seefeld am Ammersee ist nicht von einem Meteoriten verursacht worden. Vielmehr hatten 100 Kilogramm Sprengstoff das Loch in die Erde gerissen. Die Sprengung war von den Behörden ordnungsgemäß genehmigt worden. Ihr Ziel war es, ein Biotop zu schaffen. Der Krat bei Andex in Oberbayern ist nicht auf den Einschlag eines Meteoriten zurückzuführen. Ursache war vielmehr eine Sprengung, die rechtzeitig angemeldet und genehmigt worden war. Ein Privatmann hatte ein Unternehmen damit beauftragt, um auf seinem Grundstück ein Feuchtbiotop anzulegen. An einem dumpfen Schlag hatte alles begonnen und dann war es entdeckt worden. Das Loch, das dann gleich zum Krater wurde, kreisrund und 20 Meter im Durchmesser, da konnte nur Überirdisches die Hand im Spiel haben und das glaubten auch heute Morgen noch die Zeitungen. Am Morgen glaubte man in Hersching im Landkreis Starnberg noch an eine Weltsensation. Ein Brocken aus dem All, hier unweit des Ausflugsziels Kloster Andex, hat er seine Spuren hinterlassen, hieß es. Ein Riesenkrater, schöne Grüße von der Milchstraße. Die Tageszeitungen hatten ihre Schlagzeilen, wie gut, dass dieses Ding im Sumpfgebiet und nicht irgendwo in München gelandet ist. Was hätte da alles nur passieren können? Fotografen, Reporter, Schreiberlinge, auch heute sind sie früh wieder vor Ort, warten auf die Spezialisten, Wissenschaftler, die sich schon überall in der Republik auf die Socken gemacht hatten, um das Jahrhundertding zu untersuchen. Doch dann erste Gerüchte vor Ort, der Meteorit war gar keiner. Wirklich nicht? Nein, fragen es halt den Zuständigen bei der Polizei in Hersching. Und richtig, unser Himmelskörper hat ganz irdische Erklärungen. Am äh, vergangenen Samstag gegen 13 Uhr wurde von der Sprengfirma Reisch eine sogenannte Kultursprengung vorgenommen. Und zwar wird in dem Gebiet beim Egelsee ein äh, Biotop angelegt. Und die Sprengung war rechtzeitig beantragt worden und auch vom Gewerbeaufsichtsamt München Land genehmigt und an die zuständigen Behörden weitergeleitet worden. Und irgendwie auf dem Weg zu uns ist es hängen geblieben. Schlamperei mit Folgen. Ein Polizeihubschrauber entdeckte gestern bei einem Routineflug den Krater. Niemand wusste, wie man heute weiß, von einer Sprengung. Die einzige Folgerung, ein Meteorit hat eingeschlagen. Die Presse meldete, ein Touristensturm setzte ein. Bei den Medien, egal ob Rundfunk, Fernsehen, Zeitung, war Augenzeuge Bauer Arndt heiß begehrtes Interviewobjekt. Auch wir mochten da nicht beiseite stehen. Nur einen dumpfen Knall gehört und dann eine Wasserfontäne und Erden und Dreck, so circa 200 Meter hoch. Und dann war es wieder aus, dann bin ich vom Hof weggefahren, rumgefahren, geschaut, ob da irgendeine Sprengung oder was gemacht worden ist, habe aber nichts gesehen. Und dann habe ich am, heute am Sonntag Polizei gesehen mit dem Hubschrauber und dann bin ich raufgefahren und dann habe ich erfahren, was da los war. 
Los war, wie wir jetzt wissen, nichts. Nur unser Polizeidienststellenleiter, der war zwei Tage lang der berühmteste Mann weltweit. Sogar aus Japan hat das Fernsehen ihn angerufen. Sein Resümee heute? Zu spät erfahren und leid in die Hose gegangen. Also AD, du schöner Meteoritenkrater, nix ist es mit einem neuen Ausflugsziel in Oberbayern mit Würstelbude und Biergarten. Doch unter uns eine schönere Presse, nein, Polizeiente hat es wohl noch nie gegeben. 24 Stunden lang begeisterten sich Wissenschaftler, Weltraumexperten, wir Journalisten und jede Menge Schaulustige für den Einschlag eines Meteoriten im oberbayerischen Andex. Doch nun ist klar, alle haben sich geirrt. Es war kein Besuch aus dem All. Und dieselbe Erfahrung machte man heute übrigens auch im Norden Deutschlands. Roland Münzel über zwei Ereignisse der ganz seltsamen Art. Die Außerirdischen hatten alles so perfekt geplant. Landung und Kontakt mit den Erdenbewohnern hier in Stralsund, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern auf diesem Sportplatz. Rund 200 Erdlinge wollten als erstes die Besucher aus dem All willkommen heißen. Der Bürgermeister höchstpersönlich erteilte die Landeerlaubnis für das UFO. Doch ein kleiner Navigationsfehler bringt die Außerirdischen vom Kurs ab. 620 Kilometer südlich von Stralsund versinkt das Raumschiff bei München im Schlamm. Der Krater, 8 Meter tief, 20 Meter im Durchmesser, wird sogleich auf radioaktive Spuren untersucht. Die Experten sind sicher, das war ein Meteorit. Das ist ein Ereignis, was wirklich ein, von einer sensationellen Seltenheit ist. Denn es passiert nicht alle Tage, dass ein Meteorit von dieser Größe in der Nähe einer Großstadt einschlägt. So steht es auch in den Zeitungen. Doch die ganze Wahrheit ist, weder Meteorit noch UFO verursachten das Loch bei München. Es war lediglich eine harmlose Sprengung, um in der Landschaft ein Biotop anzulegen. Und wer hat es wieder als erster gemerkt? Ein Bauer, der ganz in der Nähe war, als er nämlich die Explosion gehört hat, hat gesagt, oh, die sprengen bestimmt. Aber keiner hat ihm geglaubt. Den Bauern sollte man ja glauben. Ich sag's mal wieder. Bayern. Alles über den Meteoriten, der keiner war, Jürgen Hofmann. Feuerwehrleute mit Messgeräten auf der Suche nach radioaktivem Weltraumschrott. Hubschrauber überfliegen das Einschlaggebiet, analysieren aus der Luft das unheimliche Ding aus dem All. Zeitungen verbreiten Weltuntergangsstimmung. Da machen schnell Gerüchte die Runde. Dann wäre da ein Ufer abgestürzt mit etlichen Leuten, so ungefähr drei, vier Leute, die jetzt zur Bergung beim Abrücken bereits im Andexer Klosterhof zur Sektion ausgestellt werden. Traurig für alle weitgereisten Meteoritenfans, die Erklärung ist viel einfacher. Es war eine schriftlich genehmigte Sprengung zur Schaffung eines Biotops, aber... Dieser Bescheid des Gewerbeaufsichtsamt München-Land ist heute um Viertel nach zehn bei mir auf dem Schreibtisch gelandet und ist per Kurier überbracht worden. Ausgeträumt ist der, der Traum vom Andexer Riesenmeteoriten. Doch wer weiß, vielleicht haben ja die Behörden eine Zeitungsente nur vorgetäuscht. Was gestern noch ein kosmisches Ereignis schien, ist heute nur noch ein komisches. Das Loch in der schönen oberbayerischen Landschaft stammt schlicht von einer Sprengung und nicht von einem Meteoriten. Da haben einige zu früh gejubelt. April, April, im März. Es war eine Weltsensation mitten in einem oberbayerischen Acker. Kaum zu fassen, der Meteorit, so hieß es, war messerscharf irgendwo von dort oben hier unten eingeschlagen. Polizei entdeckte ihn und rückte an. Wissenschaftler aus der ganzen Republik, Pressescharen und jede Menge Schaulustige. Welch ein Spektakel heute und dann gleich so ein dicker Brocken aus dem All. Da träumte schon so manch einer von der Touristenattraktion gleich in der Nähe des Kloster Andex. Besser geht's nicht. Dicke Schlagzeilen verkünden heute die Sensation und erzählen von den Helden dieser Geschichte. Doch dann erste Gerüchte. Der Meteorit war gar keiner. Es handelte sich um eine simple Sprengung, von der die Entdecker nichts gewusst hatten. Die Sprengung war rechtzeitig beantragt worden und auch vom Gewerbeaufsichtsamt München-Land genehmigt. Und dann die zuständigen Behörden weitergeleitet worden. Und irgendwie auf dem Weg zu uns ist es hängen geblieben. Nun gut, hier wird also ein Biotop entstehen. Aus für alle Sternenträumer. Doch eine Erkenntnis bewahren wir uns alle. Die Geschichte ist und bleibt ein Geschenk des Himmels. Ever crew members pointed telescopes at a distant quasar. They also answered questions that had been sent to NASA via the Internet Computer Network. For the first time, NASA provided computer access to virtually all aspects of the mission. Endeavour is carrying a trio of ultraviolet telescopes in its payload bay. And while the view down is something to behold, scientists are much more interested in looking the other way. 
On Thursday, crew members pointed the scopes toward a quasar about 15 billion light years away. They were searching for intergalactic helium. Finding it could further validate the Big Bang theory. For internet surfers, this has been a benchmark mission. For the first time, NASA is staffing a home page on the World Wide Web. Using a web browser, netizens can download moving images, audio clips, still pictures, and text relating to the mission. And they can pose questions which are forwarded to the astronauts. Everything from the esoteric to the downright cute. I think my personal favorite so far is from a four-year-old in Oslo, Norway, who uh, simply wrote in and said, how are things up there? We are fine here. It is snowing. Why did they schedule the liftoff for 2 AM? I like to watch. And uh, it's past my bedtime. I'm nine years old. <laughs> In all, nearly a million visitors have stopped by the Astro 2 homepage. If you would like the address, drop us an e-line at our address, and we'll have that for you a little later. You don't need a space shuttle and a multi-million dollar piece of finely calibrated optics to enjoy the world of astronomy. You can take in the celestial sights with something more modest, like this Newtonian telescope. In our March installment of Backyard Universe, a brief buyer's guide for would-be astronomers. Okay, so you're a bit starstruck. But before you buy a telescope, stay focused on this for a moment, and you might avoid getting star-stuck. I would say impulse buying is a formula for a Greek tragedy with astronomy. A chorus of experts offers this advice. Before you buy expensive lenses and mirrors, see what you can see with your God-given optics, your eyes. Just go outside, um, get yourself comfortable, lie down and look up at the sky and just watch what happens. Backyard Universe astronomer Lucy McFadden says don't rush out and buy a telescope just yet. Try binoculars first. Even in a low magnification handheld binocular, a person should be able to see four moons going around Jupiter. Telescope dealer Martin Cohen says binoculars are a good first choice because if you're not impressed by the stars, binoculars can easily be used for other things. But if they whet your astronomical appetite, this might be the next logical step. It is very lightweight. For what you see, this is a telescope that I can pick up the entire assembly in one hand. It's rugged, it's essentially a sealed system that is maintenance free. Just like a camera lens, refractor telescopes use ground glass to focus incoming light. Refractors are good for watching the planets, but not well suited for more distant galaxies. Our experts say spending less than $500 for a refractor might be a mistake. As a general rule, they, they end up in the closet or the garage. It's the kind of a thing that is designed by manufacturers to get the impulse buyer. First-time buyers might also consider the type of telescope first used by Sir Isaac Newton. Basically, we're looking at the engine that drives this telescope. A slightly concave mirror gathers light, then bounces it off a second mirror into the eyepiece. Newtonian telescopes offer a lot of performance for your money. This one carries a $1,000 price tag, including the mount it sits on. They're good for observing faint objects, but they are bulky and tricky to fine-tune. These days, many backyard astronomers use a hybrid of the refractor and the Newtonian called a schmidt cassegrain or catadioptric telescope. It uses a combination of lenses and mirrors to focus and bounce incoming light. More compact than a Newtonian, better able to see faint objects than a refractor, these telescopes do a little bit of everything. But with a $1,500 price tag, this 8-inch schmidt cassegrain may not be the first choice for everyone. Join an, an astronomy club, find out what other people use, and what telescope you like and like to use. Whatever means you have to view the backyard universe, this month you may want to check out the Pleiades. On a cloudless evening, look toward the west, find the moon, and then look to the right. The Pleiades are the brightest star cluster you'll see. You should see six bright stars with the naked eye. With binoculars or a small telescope, you'll be in for a celestial treat. The Pleiades are a cluster of young stars. That's why they're so bright. If you have a question or a complaint or a query about astronomy or anything else for that matter, we invite you to send it to our email address. It's sci-tech at cnn.com. Right now, we've got our site.
Earth are aiming Endeavour's telescopes at a galaxy some 10 billion light years away. They're trying to determine the temperature of a scorching gas halo that surrounds it. The crew on Friday aimed the telescopes towards nearby Andromeda Nebula, a giant galaxy closest to the Milky Way. Endeavour is due home March the 17th after 15 and a half days in orbit. Space Shuttle Endeavour observed the Moon in ultraviolet light for the first time Sunday. A NASA official says studying the Moon in ultraviolet light reveals some of the hidden properties of its surface. He says the astronauts will also be able to test wavelength range as a way to do remote sensing of other planetary bodies, like Mercury or outer asteroids. The astronauts are using a $195 million Astro Observatory that can sense ultraviolet light. Well, I don't think that, uh, that this flight's particularly different than any other flight that requires a, co a quiescent environment for the instruments or the samples that we're trying to grow, say, uh, in crystallography or life science experiments or whatever. Uh, one of the reasons to come to space is to, is to get that quiescent environment. And, of course, rowing, uh, when we have rowing machines aboard or biking, uh, as we have with the ergometer uh, on board on this flight, uh, tends to disturb that quiescence. And what we need to do is find a balance between uh, having people on board and, and having the experiments have the advantage of that human interaction. Uh, but then there's a price that you pay with, uh, with having to have the, uh, the humans exercise in order to be conditioned to come back. So we think that we've found a, a real good balance. We've managed to move the observations that are really critical to, uh, to microgravity uh, to areas where we are not going to do any exercise. And, and we've been getting plenty of exercise in the pre- and post-sleep time frame. Uh, the folks that are able to get away, primarily the orbiter crew, during the uh, phenomenal work day have been able to do that during observations that are not so critical. So we think that we've managed to get all the exercise in that we need and not have any impact whatsoever on the science. This is Irene Brown with UPI. I'd like to try your very first question again. Maybe um, if John could give this one a, a try. Um, does space feel a little less isolated with three spaceships, with three crews in orbit at the same time? Well, first of all, uh, even though we are up here in our uh, little vacuum bottle, uh, space doesn't feel so isolated because we uh, travel around the Earth and we see uh, all the, the great continents and cities. But uh, yeah, it does feel like with 13 humans in space, uh, space is becoming a little bit more of a, of a home for humans. And uh, it's a good feeling. Uh, this is Todd Halverson of Florida today again for uh, Dr. Durant. Um, of the hundreds of targets that you've taken uh, data on over the course of this mission, I'm wondering which one you think holds the most promise for altering our view of the universe or prompting a rewriting of astronomy textbooks? Well, probably the program that has the most potential for altering our view of the universe is the search for intergalactic helium. Um, intergalactic helium was produced in the Big Bang and is predicted to exist at a precise amount of roughly 25% helium, 75% hydrogen. Um, that has never actually been detected, although there was recently a probable detection by the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, with the measurements that we're making with ASTRO, we will not only be able to detect it, but measure the amount uh, precisely enough, I believe, to either confirm or uh, refute the idea that, he that helium was made in the ratio to hydrogen of 75% hydrogen, 25% helium. Uh, so I think that has the potential to, to either confirm or alter our view of the universe. If you're an astrophysicist, that, uh, that probably made more sense to you than it did to me. But um, it was interesting that the astronauts on board Endeavour were saying that uh, they don't feel isolated, even though they are floating around in a vacuum bottle 200 miles above the surface of the Earth, because they can continue to look down and see our home planet. Riz, that's it for our coverage of the astronauts' news conference and this, uh, this remarkable launch of an astronaut on board a Russian rocket over in the past uh, 10 or 11 hours. John, thanks for putting the down-to-earth perspective on it. <laughs> Mit einer Entfernung von 46,4 Millionen Kilometer unterbot sie dabei alle früheren amerikanischen Sonden, die sich der Sonne nur auf 60 Kilometer genähert hatten. Helios blieb während der kritischen Phase voll funktionsfähig, 
obwohl sich die Sonde nach Messungen der Deutschen Forschungs- und Versuchsanstalt für Luft- und Raumfahrt in München, Oberpfaffenhofen, bis auf 154 Grad erhitzte. Um 10.13 Uhr wusste man hier im Missionskontrollzentrum in Oberpfaffenhofen bei München, dass Helios näher an die Sonne herangekommen war als je ein anderer Trabant zuvor. Mit einem neuen Weltraumgeschwindigkeitsrekord von 237.000 Stundenkilometern hat er sich bis auf 46,4 Millionen Kilometern an die Sonne herangearbeitet. Herr Panitz, warum nun eigentlich diese Umlaufbahn? Nun, die äh, Wissenschaftler wären sicherlich gerne noch näher an die Sonne herangeflogen. Sie müssen sich jedoch vorstellen, dass bei dieser extremen Sonnenannäherung im Moment haben wir die Intensität von 10,5 Sonnen verglichen mit unserer Erde, die auf Helios einstrahlen. Insofern ist die Bahn ein Kompromiss zwischen wissenschaftlichem Wunsch und technischer Realisierbarkeit. Mhm. Trotzdem stoßen wir mit Helios in eine Region des interplanetaren Raumes vor, der vorher Messungen dieser Art nicht zugänglich war. In den drei geplanten Umlaufbahnen wird uns Helios Aufschluss geben über das solare interplanetare Plasma, die kosmische Strahlung und kosmischen Staub in dieser Region. John Holliman talks with the Endeavour's crew. This is John Holliman, CNN reporting. The Endeavour astronauts have been in orbit for 14 days now. On Friday, if they land then, they'll have been in orbit more than any other shuttle crew. Four of the team members are joining us from the flight deck. Commander Steve Oswald, pilot Bill Gregory, and ultraviolet telescope experts John Grunsfeld and Ron Paris. Gentlemen, welcome to CNN International. It's really good to see you. We've been watching your mission very closely from the ground, and we have lots of questions, so let's get to it, starting with Commander Oswald. I'm a student pilot about to take my check ride, and it seems to me the hardest job of this mission is the hardest job I have in a cockpit, landing the thing. Is it going to be any more difficult to land Endeavour after nearly 16 days away from the Earth and your practice strip? Well, I guess we'll find out in a couple of days, John, but um, I think that folks that have uh, flown at, at 15 and 14 days have said that the experience is just about the same as, uh, as landing our shuttle training airplane, or for those that had landed the shuttle before, uh, about the same at the, end of, uh, at the end of shorter flights. So I'm not anticipating that there will be any terrible difficulty in landing in 16 days. Yeah. But, uh, we'll find out in a couple of days. Yeah, now you've got this computer thing that you that you practice on called the pilot experiment. Does it help at all, do you think? Well, I think it does, at least as a uh, refresher, uh, procedurally getting ready for landing. Uh, Bill has been doing that as part of a, uh, a detailed test objective on this flight. Why don't I let you have him say a few words about it? Okay, yeah, Bill. Yeah, Bill. How was it for you? How has it been? Yeah, one of the things we can do with the computer is dial in some different winds that uh, we may encounter and also set ourselves up for different runways. So it gives us a good chance to sit down, get our procedures down, get our cross-check going, just get back in the rhythm of things. Yeah, I got a question for John now. There was lots of talk on the last Astro mission about problems getting the pointing system to find the stars and the other things you were trying to look in on. Is it noticeably better this time than last time? There was a, a wish list from ground-based astronomers at the beginning of this mission, which included about 600 different targets. How many of those have you been able to get so far? Well, I don't know the exact number at this point. Uh, the, the wish list was not uh, intended to be a list of uh, targets that we were going to get all of. They were. It was sort of a a menu to choose from during the planning of the flight as we went uh, went through the days. Um, I know yesterday, I think it was, um, uh, one of our ground controllers in Huntsville uh, congratulated us on doing our 300th observation. So um, uh, I think we're really uh, taking a big bite out of that list. No kidding. Another question for you, Ron. The astronomy community was pitching NASA um, yesterday and the day before to give you two extra days in orbit which, as you know, the, the management team turned down. What would you have been able to see that you won't be able to get because you're scheduled to come home on schedule on Friday? Well, I don't know that there's anything that we would be able to see that we can't see 
see now. It's just um, just a question of getting more targets and uh, taking a bigger bite out of that list. Now, do you know, did you tell me a minute ago you think you've captured about 300, you've done about 300 observations? And, and, and tell me about an observation. When you, when you point the telescopes, they're all looking up at this thing in space, whatever it is. Are multiple images captured or is there a stream of data that's recorded on some kind of tape? happen uh, first um, it's kind of a it's a finely choreographed sequence of events that uh, starts out with the uh, pilot uh, maneuvering the orbiter so that the payload bay is pointed toward the object that we want to look at and then um, the mission specialist John in this case um, maneuvering the instrument pointing system so that it's pointed uh, very very close to the object maybe not exactly right right on it but uh, very very close and then uh, me taking my turn and, and fine-tuning the pointing a little bit to get the, uh, the exact target down the apertures of the telescopes. However, there are three different telescopes mounted out there on the pointing system. One of them uh, built at Johns Hopkins University is a spectrograph. Uh, one, the one from um, the University of Wisconsin is, uh, is a spectro-polarimeter, measures polarization as well. And the ultraviolet imaging telescope from Goddard Space Flight Center um, captures ultraviolet images. Uh, the two spectrographs have a data stream which is transmitted to the ground uh, in real time so they get a look at the data fairly quickly. Uh, the ultraviolet imaging telescope captures the images on film and uh, so we've got a lot of very precious film out in the payload bay which will be processed uh, uh, soon after landing. Yeah, um, how long do you think it's going to take to get that film developed and which one of the pictures do you personally want to look at first? John, I, uh, I couldn't tell you that. We've been uh, cranking through observations so fast up here that uh, I'm not, not completely sure what all we've observed and what we haven't observed, but uh, it'll be um, a few weeks um, after we land before we get the film processed, and then it takes a while to make duplicates of the flight film so that uh, we don't lose anything and, uh, and start examining the images. All right, Ron, John, Bill, and Steve, thank the four of you for taking time out of your very busy day. I know we cost you some experiment time because we did our interview at this time of day, but you've really you've provided a lot of insight into what's going on up there, and uh, those of us at the CNN family, thank you very much for it. Well, thanks for coming aboard. We enjoyed talking with you. All right, see you later. That's it, live from the uh, flight deck of the Space Shuttle Endeavor, uh, an interview with the astronauts, uh, four of the seven who were there. They are scheduled to be coming back to Earth on Friday afternoon. We will, of course, have live coverage as we have throughout the mission. John Holloman, CNN reporting. And that concludes our focus segment this hour. Der Theoretenanschlag gehalten worden war, beschäftigte heute den Landtag. Umweltminister Goppel hielt dabei die Bedenken der Fraktion Bündnis 90 Die Grünen für berechtigt, dass durch die Sprengung das umliegende Feuchtgebiet austrocknen könne. Gut zehn Tage ist es her, da erschütterte ganz Deutschland die Meer vom Meteoriteneinschlag am Egelsee. In Form eines Dringlichkeitsantrages der Grünen gab es nun im Bayerischen Landtag einen Nachhall. Zu abenteuerlich sei das Ganze gewesen, meinten die Grünen, sie fordern Konsequenzen. Dass vor allen Dingen geprüft werden muss, ob die wasserrückhaltenden Schichten verletzt worden sind und ob die große Menge Sprengstoffs den Untergrund so geschädigt hat, dass Wasser eventuell auch vom Egelsee ablaufen kann. Wenn hier die Vorarbeiten sehr zügig geleistet worden sind, dann muss unverzüglich sichergestellt werden, dass auf Kosten der Verursacher der ursprüngliche Zustand wiederhergestellt wird. Durchaus berechtigt seien die Bedenken der Grünen, dass der Egelsee und das umliegende Feuchtgebiet austrocknen könnten, so Bayerns Umweltminister Thomas Goppel. Die CSU stimmte für den Antrag mit einer Ergänzung. Deswegen bitte ich den Antrag am Ende, um folgende Formulierung zu ergänzen. Wieder ursprünglichen Zustand wiederherzustellen, wenn die Prüfung der Behörden ergibt, dass nicht auf andere Weise rechtmäßige Zustände besser hergestellt werden können. Wenn Sie diesem Antrag so zustimmen, tun wir uns in der Arbeit leichter. Vielen Dank. Zentrale Frage der Astronomen, wie groß und wie alt ist das Universum? Der Urknall scheint die einzige Erklärung dafür, dass unser Universum in alle Richtungen auseinanderfliegt. Nach neuesten Daten des Hubble-Teleskops ist das Universum 8 bis 12 Milliarden Jahre alt. Diese Ungenauigkeit kommt daher, 
weil die Gesamtmasse des Weltalls nicht genau bekannt ist. Mit der heute sichtbaren Materie lassen sich Schwerkrafteffekte wie die Rotation von riesigen Galaxien nicht erklären. Ein großer Teil des Universums scheint den irdischen Fernrohren bislang verborgen geblieben zu sein. Zum Beispiel in sogenannten schwarzen Löchern. Das sind Sterne mit so hoher Anziehungskraft, dass sie sogar die Lichtstrahlen in ihren Kern ziehen. Ein Stern, der explodiert oder sich zu einem schwarzen Loch zusammenzieht, hat den gleichen Effekt wie ein Stein, der ins Wasser fällt. Es breiten sich Gravitationswellen aus, deren Wirkung beobachtet werden kann. Im Zentrum dieser Galaxie wurde mit dem Hubble-Weltraumteleskop eine spiralförmige Struktur entdeckt. Diese Scheibe aus Gas und Sternen dreht sich mit ungewöhnlich hoher Geschwindigkeit um den Kern der Galaxie. Aus dem Zentrum dieser Galaxie muss daher eine enorme Gravitationskraft ausgehen, die nur von einem supermassiven schwarzen Loch stammen kann. Auf der Suche nach der fehlenden Materie im Weltall wurde von den Astronomen auch vermutet, dass sie sich in schwach leuchtenden Sternen verstecken könnte. Man kann vorausberechnen, wie viele solcher schwachen Sterne man an bestimmten Stellen des Himmels finden sollte. Wir haben mit dem Hubble-Weltraumteleskop nachgeschaut, aber auch an den hier zum Beispiel gelb markierten Stellen keinen einzigen solcher schwachen Sterne gefunden. Damit bleibt der Aufenthaltsort dieser fehlenden Materie im wahrsten Sinne des Wortes im Dunkeln. Trotz oder gerade wegen des Hubble-Teleskops stehen die Astronomen in einem Dilemma. Sie können einen Großteil der errechneten Masse des Weltalls einfach nicht finden. Das Universum bleibt auch weiterhin ein unendliches Rätsel. Kaum zu glauben, dass um dieses trostlose Fleckchen Erde ein erbitterter Streit tobt. Hier gibt es kein Gold, hier gibt es kein Öl. Nein, gerade hier, rein gar nichts gibt, macht die Gegend für eine kleine Gruppe von Spezialisten so attraktiv. Wir sind in Chile, in der Atacama-Wüste und der Berg heißt Cerro Paranal. Hier will die europäische Südsternwarte ESO, das größte und modernste Teleskop der Welt bauen. VLT, Very Large Telescope. Ein Ensemble von vier gigantischen Spiegeln. Für Astronomen ist das Terrain ideal, trocken und leer, über 300 klare Nächte pro Jahr. Das VLT ist ein entscheidender Schritt in Richtung Europa, Weltspitze in der Astronomie. Es scheint sich um einen der weltbesten, wenn nicht den weltbesten Ort für ein bodengebundenes Teleskop zu handeln. Seit über 30 Jahren ist die ESO Gast mit gewissermaßen diplomatischem Status in Chile. Südlich von Santiago betreibt sie das Observatorium La Silla, das zu den renommiertesten der Welt gehört. Spektakuläre Entdeckungen wurden hier gemacht. Und die Beziehungen zwischen dem Land und den Astronomen brachten beiden Vorteile. Als die ESO vor einigen Jahren den Standort für ein noch größeres Observatorium suchte, zeigte sich die Republik Chile großzügig. Sie schenkte ein paar hundert Quadratkilometer Wüste rund um den Cerro Paranal. Doch man hatte die Rechnung ohne ihn gemacht, den Admiral Juan José La Torre. Im sogenannten Salpeterkrieg vor über 100 Jahren hat er den heutigen Norden Chiles von Peru erobert. Als Lohn für seine Heldentaten habe der Admiral, so behaupten jetzt seine Erben, genau jene 22 Quadratkilometer am Gipfel des Paranal erhalten, wo die ESO ihr Observatorium baut. Ein peinlicher Streit beschäftigt die Gerichte. Hätte die Republik Chile das Land gar nicht verschenken dürfen? Und wem gehört es nun eigentlich? Der ESO oder den Erben? Was äh, unbezweifelt äh, ist, ist, dass die, die Schenkung völkerrechtlich äh, völlig rechtsgültig erfolgt ist. Die Erben der Familie La Torre können nur gegen den chilenischen Staat vorgehen. Sie können nur äh, erreichen, allenfalls, dass der chilenische Staat äh, verurteilt wird, ihnen eine Entschädigung für äh, Land zu äh, geben, dass er sich fälschlicherweise oder unrechtmäßigerweise äh, angeeignet hat, um es dann der ESO weiterzuschenken. 30 Millionen sind schon verbaut. Und nun hat das Gericht auf Antrag der Erben die Arbeiten gestoppt. Dennoch hat die Familie La Torre in Chile eine schlechte Presse. Wenn Don Juan José, der Admiral, noch am Leben wäre, so heißt es, er hätte zweifellos sein Land für die Kultur, für die Wissenschaft 
und den Ruhm Chiles hingegeben. Es erwies sich als ein unglücklicher Einfall, dass ein Minister den zuständigen Richter aufsuchte, wohl um ihm den Ernst der Lage klarzumachen. Denn nun wurde das Parlament hellhörig, witterte politischen Druck auf die unabhängige Justiz und das ist im demokratischen Chile ganz und gar nicht populär. 600 Millionen will die ESO insgesamt investieren. Da ist es menschlich verständlich, dass die Erben die vielleicht einzige Gelegenheit nutzen wollen, aus der Einöde eine Goldgrube zu machen. Wenn aber das Observatorium zur Bauruine würde, dann wäre das Land den Staub nicht mehr wert, der schon aufgewirbelt wurde. Still wet across the southeastern United States, including Florida. Things have dried out a bit in California, but there's another system moving toward the northwest coast that could, on Saturday or Sunday, produce some rain in northern sections of California. Pretty mild across much of the U.S. as well. Have a snowy Saskatchewan into Manitoba, also across Quebec. Some rain could change to snow in New England as well. Still dry in California, but there is a system way for the weekend could bring some rains to the north anyway. A complete forecast coming up within the hour. Astronauts were given an extra day in orbit. Cloudy weather at the landing site in Florida caused NASA officials to call off the scheduled return Friday. If the weather does not get better, Endeavour may land in California instead. The astronauts took a break on their bonus day as all their experiments had already been packed away. And this is already the longest shuttle mission ever. And in news that might bring joy to thirsty astronauts, three British astronomers have reportedly discovered enough alcohol in space to make 200 trillion trillion liters of beer. The Times of London reports the scientists, while studying star formation, stumbled upon the enormous cloud of alcohol. But it's 10,000 light years away from any potential drinkers on Earth. Schlechtes Wetter. Nach Angaben der NASA soll das Shuttle heute um 21.19 Uhr mitteleuropäischer Zeit in Florida aufsetzen. Wenn sich das Wetter dort weiter verschlechtere, sei auch eine Landung in Kalifornien möglich, hieß es in Cape Canaveral. Die Endeavour-Mission verlängert sich damit auf knapp 17 Tage. Sie ist bereits jetzt der längste aller Shuttle-Flüge der NASA. Seit dem 2. März beobachten die sieben Astronauten an Bord mit einem neuartigen Teleskop Planeten, Sterne und Galaxien. If the weather in Florida doesn't improve, Endeavour may land in California instead. The seven astronauts aboard, meanwhile, are taking a break to enjoy the view from space on their bonus day, since most of their equipment already is packed away. And what they can see from space, of course, is all the clouds around Earth. And so let's turn to CNN's Dave Hennen to look. North American weather, low pressure, a couple areas of weak low pressure producing a few scattered uh, rain showers. A system uh, moving around Lake Winnipeg producing some snow up through central Canada and extending through Ontario. Things are quieting down in California and the west coast of the U.S. That is an updated look at your world weather forecast. From CNN International, this is World News with Sonia Rusler from the CNN Center. Hello and welcome. It's called Endeavour, but even despite the best efforts, a patch of clear skies could not be found over Kennedy Space Center in Florida, so the U.S. shuttle has now been diverted. It's scheduled to land on a runway in the California desert in less than an hour. Well, CNN's correspondent John Holloman is here. John, why is it when they're so high-tech they can do anything in space that if there's clouds they can't land? Well, because all of the high-tech stuff on the shuttle is the part that gets it up into orbit. There's very little high-tech stuff when it comes down. The shuttle doesn't even qualify as an airplane. I don't know if you know, it doesn't have an engine. It doesn't have anything to give it forward speed except gravity. Let me show you why they are landing in California. Sonia, there's a, a picture here that um, came in just a few minutes ago showing you what it looks like in the California desert. You can see some high clouds there, but for the most part, it's a hot, sunny day. And um, in Florida right now, there are high winds, there are thunderstorms. Yesterday there was some hail the size of golf balls that was coming down. All that stuff could A, damage the shuttle. The wind could blow it off the runway and it would have a wreck. That's why it can't land when the wind is greater than 15 to 18 knots coming from some directions and why it can't land when there's thundery, cloudy weather. Okay, so the weather does look quite good in California now, but it's already a record-breaking long space shuttle journey. Would there be a point when they'd absolutely have to land? Yeah, they really wanted to land today, uh, but the main reason for that not being that they're going to run out of air and food. They have enough of that. 
probably to go for three or four more days. I mean, it would, get, it would be dire straits if they were up there another four days because they would be getting low on things they need to exist. But they wanted to land as quickly as they could because they don't have any experience with a pilot and commander driving this, running the controls after this many days in weightlessness. You know, your body, they're going to become weightless all of a sudden in about 40 minutes after not having had any weight to carry around. They may get, you know, chest palpitations or they may just feel bad because they weigh so much after not having weighed anything. It might affect their ability to drive the spaceship. And in a very dire emergency, very simple question, could they actually land at any airport in the world if it really came to that? Absolutely. If the runway is as long as 10,000 feet, and most of the big runways have runways that are about two miles, you know, three kilometers long, the shuttle can get down one way or the other. It might have some damage, but uh, there, there's been talk of that, in fact, uh, in emergencies. Okay, CNN's John Holman, we're waiting for the shuttle Endeavour to land in California then within yep. the hour. Thank you for joining All us. All right, see you later. Okay. Welcome back. Here's a brief look at the hour's top stories. The U.S. Space Shuttle Endeavour is scheduled to land in just a few minutes. Bad weather at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida diverted the landing to a military runway in the California desert. The Endeavour crew has been in space for nearly 17 days, a record for the U.S. Space Shuttle program. The following is CNN's coverage of a live event. Hello, this is John Holloman. The Space Shuttle Endeavour is in its final few minutes of a record-breaking journey. Let's go now to Edwards Air Force Base in California, where you can see the shuttle coming in. It's less than a minute and a half from landing. In about that amount of time, it'll be on the ground at Edwards Air Force Base. We'll listen in to the final seconds of this, the longest shuttle mission ever. It almost made 17 days in space for the shuttle and its crew. The weather in Florida blew off any chance to land there today. It's too windy, too cloudy, and too rainy. But in the Mojave Desert, which you'll see coming into view momentarily, where Edwards Air Force Base is located, there are just some high clouds. But a few minutes ago, there was a dust storm up at one end of the runway to be used by the shuttle. We'll see as Endeavour comes in for its final few seconds if we can still see the remnants of that dust storm. NASA commentator Rob Navius will talk us through the touchdown. On this mission, the Shuttle Endeavour and its crew conducted a great number of ultraviolet telescope picture-taking sessions in space. More than 300 objects were targeted. I think we'll be able to hear the sound of the shuttle, even though it has no engines, as it makes its final descent, final approach for this landing. Endeavour is uh, traveling right now at a descent rate seven times steeper than that of a commercial jetliner as Oswald prepares to flare up the nose prior to landing. Pilot Bill Gregory has deployed the landing gear. Main gear touchdown. Nose gear touchdown. The drag chute has been deployed. Endeavour rolling out on runway 22 at Edwards Air Force Base to complete a shuttle record 6.9 million mile astronomy research flight. What a beautiful sight. On this mission, Endeavour and its crew of two women, for just a moment, we're going to listen in to welcoming Endeavor. message here. And welcome home, Endeavour, after a fantastic record-setting mission. It'll be a tough one to beat, and it sure is nice to have you all home. Yeah, it's nice to be here, Kurt. At any rate, the shuttle Endeavour and its crew of two women and five men managed to find 300 celestial objects and get them into the sights of three ultraviolet telescopes. Most of the pictures from the telescopes still on undeveloped film inside the shuttle. The film will be developed in about a month. Next shuttle mission coming up in June when Atlantis goes up to pick up Norm Thaggart, who's living across the uh, 
Um, I beg your pardon. The uh, shuttle in about uh, the first week in June will go to uh, pick up Norm Thaggart, who's been living aboard the Russian Mir space station for some time. CNN's continuing news coverage, more in a moment. John Holliman, CNN reporting. This has been a CNN live event. Two, one. From launch to landing, Endeavour made lots of history, but the thing it'll be remembered for is endurance. The two women and five men aboard have been in space longer than any previous shuttle crew. While they were there, another crew was launched into space. A Soyuz rocket with the first American to fly on a Russian spaceship lifted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. All systems are looking good. And at that moment, there were 13 people in space, more than have ever been weightless at the same time before. Shuttle Commander Steve Oswald talked about the significance. I think that this has gotten to be a large enough operation that no country can really afford to go it alone. And I think that the kind of international cooperation that we're seeing now between uh, the Russians ourselves and our other partners in the International Space Station is the way of the future. And when the two Russian ships docked, the astronauts, like the rest of us, were waiting expectantly. Distance between the two vehicles is now about 10 meters, which is about 30 feet. Closing very quickly. Uh, this, uh, this is taking place just south of the Moscow area. The goal for this shuttle mission was to take ultraviolet pictures of distant galaxies and even closer objects, including Jupiter and the moon. The pictures haven't been developed yet, but early indications are they'll be as spectacular as those from the Hubble Space Telescope. And for the astronauts, more than two weeks alone has not been all that bad. Uh, space doesn't feel so isolated because we uh, travel around the Earth and we see uh, all the, the great continents and cities. But uh, yeah, it does feel like with 13 humans in space, uh, space is becoming a little bit more of a, of a home for humans. One of the astrophysicists on this mission defended the millions of dollars it costs to send humans and telescopes into space. Well, I think the average taxpayer in America has a lot of intellectual curiosity and wants to learn more about the world they live in, the universe they live in, how the solar system evolved, how the universe formed. And so I think that it speaks to the quality of life because it feeds our intellectual curiosity. With Endeavour's landing, the curiosity connected to spaceflight will have to wait until June when Atlantis takes off to bring Norm Thaggart home from the Russian space station. The launch pads in Florida will be quiet until then. John Holloman, CNN reporting. Tagen im All ist die US-Raumfähre Endeavour sicher auf die Erde zurückgekehrt. Wegen des schlechten Wetters in Florida musste die Endeavour auf der Ausweichstation Edwards in Kalifornien aufsetzen. Die siebenköpfige Crew stellte mit ihrer Mission einen neuen Rekord auf. Noch nie war eine amerikanische Raumfähre so lange im All. Check out these images from the Hubble Space Telescope. With a little computer enhancement, astronomers claim these are the truest colors from the red planet ever seen here on the blue planet. The goal is to learn more about the climate of Mars where dust storms fueled by high winds have been known to envelop the entire planet. But a Martian meteorologist might offer a rosy forecast. It appears Mars is chilling out. Mars is being very uh, stable right now. It's not exhibiting these very dramatic surface changes. And that's all very consistent with this new picture of the colder atmosphere without a lot of dust in it, because dust is the key to changing the albedo, or the brightness of the surface. Scientists say understanding the weather on Mars is important, so NASA can make final plans for a series of unmanned missions to the Red Planet over the next decade. The first lander is slated to touch down in July of 1997. Well, you can't land on Jupiter because the planet is mostly gas, but you can send a space probe into the soup to see what it is made of. And apparently all systems are go to do just that starting this summer. The probe is piggybacking on NASA's Galileo spacecraft, which was launched in 1989. Ground controllers gave Galileo a call this week to see if the probe was ready for its kamikaze mission. And Galileo sent back nothing but good news. Batteries, check. Spectrometer, check. Command and response system, double check. Galileo's probe should begin its swan dive on July 13th. It will enter Jupiter's atmosphere in December. Evidence released this week suggests there may be large underground reservoirs of H2O on Mars. University of Michigan researcher Thomas Donahue found evidence of an aquifer by analyzing meteorites from the Red Planet. It supports theories that there may have once been life on Mars because scientists believe water is an essential ingredient for keeping living things living.
Tim Puckett is a serious amateur astronomer. But last year, he observed something which took his breath away. Well, I was, uh, you know how you almost get in an auto wreck and your heart starts pumping? That's about what, the way I felt. And, uh, Puckett and his viewing partner, Jerry Armstrong, were the first to see an exploding star called a supernova. It was unbelievable that we were first. There's no way of knowing when one of these things is going to go off. The chain of events which leads to a supernova begins when a dying star starts to run out of hydrogen, the fuel which keeps it twinkling. As the star begins to conk out, it begins to pulsate violently. The vibrations create supersonic shock waves which move in opposite directions. When the shock waves collide, they cause the star to explode with a mind-boggling force. Voila, a supernova. We see this star all of a sudden become bright in the sky to the point where we can see it during the day. Backyard Universe That's astronomer Lucy right. McFadden That's says there are remnants of a handful of supernovas in our celestial neighborhood, the Milky Way. About 700 have been spotted in other galaxies. In 1987, an astronomer looking for something else stumbled onto a supernova while it was still getting brighter. It gave scientists a chance to learn more about supernovas. They say these explosions cause the sudden release and spread of heavy elements, which are the essential ingredients of life. In fact, all the oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon in the universe can be traced back to supernova explosions. So this month, backyard astronomers can literally catch a glimpse of the origins of life by seeking out the Crab Nebula. It is the remnants of a supernova which was first observed on Earth nearly 950 years ago. And to me, the amazing thing about it is not just seeing it, but it's the combination of seeing it and knowing that it was first seen in 1054, um, knowing that it was due, that it, that is the remnant of an explosion that brought materials that make it possible for life to form. On a clear evening this week, you might spot the Crab Nebula in the western sky. Find the moon and then look down and to the right for a smudge of light between two brighter stars. The moon will move higher in the sky as the week goes on. Or perhaps you may discover a supernova of your own. Turns out amateurs often do. Any amateur astronomer with a six-inch telescope could go out in their backyard and scan galaxies. It's really like uh, playing the lottery. You really have no idea what you're going to get when you get it. It takes time and patience, and unlike comets, supernovae aren't named for their discoverers. But supernova finders say it's a thrill just the same. You can find some more details on how to spot supernovas and enjoy the backyard universe in general in the CNN forum on CompuServe. The images, captured last fall, show lots of changes in cloud patterns over the years and even within the course of a few weeks. The astronomers compared the Hubble images with these pictures taken by the Voyager spacecraft in 1989. The comparison suggests that Neptune has constantly changing weather, kind of like Earth. That's a surprise to astronomers who thought there wasn't much going on there. The planet Neptune is about 17 times more massive than Earth and like Jupiter is made mostly of gas. It is currently the most distant planet from our sun. Normally Pluto is, but its eccentric orbit has brought it inside Neptune for the next three years. Gene Shoemaker, best known as co-discoverer of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, the Wabar Crater may be the youngest, best-preserved meteor impact site on the planet. The meteor hit more than 6,000 years ago with a force equivalent to 100,000 tons of TNT. Blew itself to pieces, in fact. The scientists got to the remote site in desert terrain vehicles since it's too sandy for conventional aircraft to land, but the sand actually helped to preserve the crater as a source of information about meteor impacts on Earth. Time again for our monthly look at our backyard universe. This month, it's time to cast a telescopic glance toward the most beautiful object in our solar system, the giant gassy planet Saturn. It is the rings, of course, that make Saturn so spectacular. But this month, they will begin a rare disappearing act, a spectacular sight in its own right. It is a sight seldom forgotten, the first glimpse of Saturn and its stunning rings. Backyard Universe astronomer Lucy McFadden remembers it well. Those rings were like animations. It was the first time I really perceived that there were other worlds out there. But this month, the rings will vanish right before a backyard astronomer's eyes. 
the Earth passes through the ring plane of Saturn, and the effect then is that the rings get very, very thin uh, for a short period of time, and then after that we actually start seeing the unilluminated side of the rings. A complex series of orbital coincidences gives us this unusual view of the edge of Saturn's rings. The Earth will pass through the ring plane three times on May 22nd, August 10th, and February 11th of next year. And on November 19th, while the Earth is above Saturn, the Sun will pass through the ring plane, illuminating only the edges, and the rings will again disappear from view. It's a chain of events which won't be repeated for 43 years. And while it is a visual novelty for many backyard astronomers, it is also an opportunity for professionals to learn more about Saturn. We can actually make a direct measurement of the thickness of the rings, because the rings are edge on. Uh, we can see, for example, things like the warps, the bends in the ring plane, some very, very subtle effects. And they may get a glimpse of some of Saturn's moons, which are normally obscured by the rings. All of this will help lay the groundwork for NASA's Cassini spacecraft mission, which should reach Saturn in 2004. It should help answer some questions about the mysterious planet and its rings. The rings of Saturn are mainly uh, dirty ice balls, but the question is how dirty and, and how big are these balls of ice? Seeing the edge of Saturn's rings with a small telescope won't be easy. They're only about a mile thick. And this month, you will have to get up early to see Saturn. It will rise about two hours before the sun. Don't confuse it with Venus, which will rise later and be much brighter. Point your telescope to the east-southeast, and with some luck, you'll be on the cutting edge of a rare celestial sight. It turns out August may be the best time to catch a glimpse of Saturn and its rings on edge. By then, the planet will be visible for most of the night. What happened to Jupiter last summer will happen here, probably not anytime soon, but some astronomers say now is the time to start looking for trouble. Hello and welcome, I'm Miles O'Brien, reporting this week from Monterey, California. Chicken Little, where are you? Your vindication may have finally come. Astronomers are now virtually certain one day the sky will in fact be falling. Maybe not anytime soon, but if you plan to live for a million years, you can count on it. An object big enough to cause some real trouble will paint a bullseye on our blue planet. This may not make your list of worries, but since last summer's comet collision on Jupiter, many astronomers are wondering what, if anything, we should do about it. Ten months after the shattered comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 homed in on Jupiter, leaving a trail of bruises, scientists here on Earth are still trading verbal blows over what happened. Were the comet fragments big or small? Did they plunge deep into the atmosphere or dent the surface? All open questions. But there is wide agreement on one point. This once in a millennium event witnessed by the world has driven home a fundamental point. The Earth has been hit by comets and asteroids in the past and it will be hit again. We don't know when. Uh, the question isn't if, the question is when. 65 million years ago, a comet or asteroid six miles in diameter plowed into Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, kicking up a dust storm which shrouded the Earth in darkness, killing plants and causing the extinction of many species, including the dinosaurs. A rare occurrence, but scientists can't be sure how rare. In the history of mankind, astronomers have found 300 near-Earth objects. They believe that's only 10% of the total. The total number of astronomers who's looking for comets and asteroids today is smaller than the staff of one McDonald's restaurant. It's really not very much of an effort considering the potential threat that these objects pose to life on Earth. In fact, the husband and wife team of Carolyn and Jean Shoemaker were a part of that meager search when they and David Levy discovered Shoemaker-Levy 9. Now Jean Shoemaker is heading a committee which in a few weeks will issue a report to NASA on ways to conduct a more coordinated sky survey. Even though the odds are very, very small that a globally threatening object is going to hit us, say, in the next century, well, they're not that small. There's about one chance in a thousand that there's something out there that will hit us in the next century that could be a global problem. If money were no object, Shoemaker would dedicate a half dozen telescopes which can record images electronically to look for near-Earth objects. One would be large enough to scope out comets whose long orbits take them to the outer edges of the solar system. But of course, money is an object, especially nowadays here in Washington. 
So for the past eight months, Gene Shoemaker's committee has been looking at ways to more aggressively search for near-Earth objects on a shoestring budget. To do that, the committee will ask for help from the Pentagon. Specifically, the Air Force, which currently operates a network of telescopes to track satellites and space junk. With some modification, these telescopes could, in 10 years' time, find 80% of the asteroids large enough to cause a global catastrophe. But Shoemaker says the Air Force telescopes are not capable of conducting a serious search for comets. I think comets are a bigger part of the problem. So we can't deal with the whole problem, but we can deal with a very significant part of it. Uh, on a more constrained budget. Shoemaker says his committee will suggest NASA spend about $4 million a year on the hunt for near-Earth objects. Small potatoes in Washington, but the NASA budget is shrinking dramatically. Still, California Congressman George Brown, who commissioned the Shoemaker report, is convinced the plan will become a reality. This involves the future of human life on Earth. Uh, I think it's uh, well worth devoting the small amount of energy required. Uh, for a few million dollars in the efforts of a, probably a few dozen professionals around the Earth. So what if the professionals do find a large object with Earth in its crosshairs? Then what? Most scientists believe it is theoretically possible to launch a nuclear bomb toward a comet or asteroid, then detonate it nearby. And use the force of that explosion just to very slightly change the speed of the asteroid and uh, that would be enough to go from uh, Earth impact trajectory to a trajectory that would miss the planet completely. Far-fetched as it may sound, the idea is a topic of discussion at the nation's nuclear weapons laboratories. Would you suggest we start building the, the launching fleet right now? No way. No way. I think, I think we should do this step by step. I think we should, we should first, let's find everything there is out there. Let's just, let's just explore a little bit. It would be a way of, of like buying an insurance policy to make sure that there's nothing out there with our name on it. According to one estimate, the chances of having killed by an asteroid inscribed on your tombstone are 1 in 20,000. Since no one knows anyone who is killed by an asteroid, those odds may be a bit misleading. Just remember, we're talking about a catastrophe which could wipe out the entire population of the planet. New images from the Hubble Space Telescope offering an up-close look at the birth of several stars. The pictures show pancakes of gas that shoot out huge jets into space as they compress and ignite to form stars. Astronomers have theorized about that process for years, so they were happy to see that the Hubble pictures match those theories. Amateur astronomers may not have an orbiting space telescope at their disposal for a night of viewing, but they do have access to many other tools which professionals routinely employ. Among them, computers. Professionals have long used them to find stars and point telescopes. In the past few years, growing numbers of backyard viewers have logged in as well. Here's our monthly look at the backyard universe. This is, uh, this is a book, the earliest book that we have here in the library at the Naval Observatory. They are roadmaps to the heavens, and they have been guiding eyes skyward since Gutenberg invented the printing press. This is about 1603, so this is uh, six years or so. Stephen Dick is the historian at the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington. These are all rare books, about a thousand rare books. He presides over perhaps the finest collection of rare and antique astronomical charts and catalogs in the U.S. This is a very early example of what we call an ephemeris, or a table of predicted positions. Amateur astronomers of today often still use paper charts to navigate the night sky, but for even the best map readers, this can be a challenging task. So you end up folding and bending and turning the chart to try and get yourself oriented on the sky. And unless you're very patient, you might give up in disgust. So Backyard Universe astronomer Lucy McFadden recommends amateurs go digital. There are dozens of computer programs that make it much easier to locate objects in your backyard. Because it will do the computation for you. The only thing you have to know is where you are and what time it is. The sky is one of many similar programs which do just that. For about $130, it displays maps customized to your place, time, and which way you are looking. 
Pointing and clicking on objects generates boxes filled with information and in some cases images. The sky can be set to match your viewing conditions, so city dwellers won't be confused by lots of stars they cannot see. It also has a red display which preserves your night vision, so it can be used while you observe. Of course, if you don't have a notebook computer, many of those features won't do you much good. But these programs allow you to print out your custom charts, and there's nothing more portable than a piece of paper. And with some additional hardware, many of these programs can automatically point a motor-driven telescope to a desired target. Serious amateurs may soon be taking the next step in astronomy software. Astronomers at the Space Telescope Science Institute are making the comprehensive sky survey used to point the Hubble available to amateurs. This is the way the sky looks. If you pointed a telescope at a particular place in the sky, this is what you would see. When it becomes available next year, the 16 CD-ROM digitized sky survey should cost about $300. We believe that there are several thousand uh, amateur astronomers, maybe even 10,000, who have both the computers and the telescopes to make really effective use of this. For years, professional astronomers have found computers an essential tool of their trade. Today, more and more amateurs would agree. Do you suppose in four or 500 years we'll go walk into a vault like this and there'll be some old floppy disks. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure there will. Bibliophiles may blanch at the thought, but many astronomers are trading Gutenberg for gigabytes. Hello and welcome. I'm Miles O'Brien. One scientist is calling it a giant floodlight which illuminates 10 billion years of intergalactic history. He's talking about a telescope payload carried into orbit by the Space Shuttle Endeavour in March. Taking ultraviolet measurements, which cannot be obtained on Earth, Astro 2 spotted more proof the universe began in a sudden explosive instant. Lori Waffenschmidt has more on the story of helium and the Big Bang. During its March mission, the shuttle Endeavour carried a package of telescopes that can see ultraviolet light, invisible to our eyes and to most telescopes. One of the observations from that mission is now providing powerful support for the idea that the universe began with a Big Bang. Scientists think just after the Big Bang, all that existed was a very hot mixture of hydrogen and helium. As the gases cooled, they condensed into stars and eventually formed the other elements that allowed life to begin. If the theory is right, there should still be some hydrogen and helium remaining from the Big Bang. Scientists have been looking for those ancient gases for years. Now, Arthur Davidson and his colleagues say they found some of that helium. In order to find the helium, we looked at a very distant and very luminous quasar, very powerful energy source uh, that we can see billions of light years away across vast reaches of intergalactic space. The ultraviolet telescope was able to spot the signature of the helium in the quasar. Almost 10 helium found both fit what the Big Bang theories predicted. The data also suggests that only a small percentage of that original hydrogen and helium has been used up so far to form stars. The amount of matter we see in stars and galaxies around us is much less than the amount of matter we think exists in the universe. So the missing stuff we call the dark matter. And what we've found now is part of that dark matter. Not all of what's suspected to be there, but we've found uh, a component of the dark matter. Finding primordial helium is not the only use for the ultraviolet telescopes. They're also helping astronomers study hot young stars, which show up much better when viewed in the ultraviolet. Lori Waffenschmidt, CNN, reporting. Actually, astronomers think there's a lot more hydrogen than helium still hanging around the universe from the Big Bang. Turns out helium, though, is easier to spot. Endeavour is poised at launch pad 39A, ready for the second launch of the year. All countdown events are on schedule, and the launch team here in Fire Room 3 is not tracking any technical issues. That would prevent an on-time launch at 1.37 a.m. Eastern Time. The window extends today for two and a half hours, or until 4.07. In just a few minutes, we will be getting live coverage of the flight crew sitting down to have their pre-flight meal. Crew has been divided up onto two teams, the red and the blue team, so that they can operate in two different shifts during the flight for 24 hours of data collection.
And here we have the crew of Mission STS-67. Here we have Dr. Ron Paris, payload specialist, flying on the shuttle for the second time today. Sitting next to him is Dr. John Grunsfeld, also flying for the second time as a payload specialist. And we have the rookie pilot, Bill Gregory, Commander Steve Oswald, flying for the third time today. Payload Commander Tamara Jernigan, she's also flying aboard the shuttle for the third time today. And we have Sam Durance, flying aboard the shuttle again. And we have rookie Wendy Lawrence, she's also the flight engineer. We will be going into a uh, weather briefing, getting an update on conditions here at Kennedy Space Center and also at the Transoceanic Abort Sites. Then they'll get into their launch and entry suits and ride out to the launch pad, climb aboard the shuttle and prepare for launch today. Countdown clock has uh, remained at T minus three hours and holding got about nine minutes remaining in this hold. Got about five minutes remaining in this built-in hold. At T minus three hours and holding, this is shuttle launch control. Here we have the astronauts for STS-67 on the third floor of the operations and checkout building. And now going to, uh, coming down the hallway, going to an elevator. This is shuttle launch control. The STS-67 crew has arrived at launch pad 39A at the 195 foot level. Just getting off the elevators and uh, they will be walking across the orbiter access arm. See pilot Bill Gregory They're just uh, giving a wave here. Um, crew is getting ready to uh, climb aboard the orbiter. Yeah, let's see. 
Orbiter access crew arm is being retracted away from the vehicle and into the launch configuration. This arm can be extended in just a few seconds if necessary. Okay, I'm going forward. I'm sending the money to. Okay, that's yes out. Profile test of the orbiter's aero surfaces has started. Orbiter flight control services are being moved through a pre-programmed pattern to verify they are ready for launch. The three main engines are being gimbaled and positioned for launch. All systems are go for launch at this time, just a few minutes away from the eighth voyage of Endeavour with a crew of seven on a 16-day flight to study the invisible universe. Endeavour OTC, close and lock your visors, make sure 802 close, and good luck on your record-setting 16-day mission. Okay, we'll close them and start the flow. And in fact, Mr. Talon and his boys, Talon and us, the spaceship. And if Dr. Holly doesn't have the bag on yet, because you haven't put it on now. T minus 20 seconds. Thousands of gallons of water will be dumped onto the launch platform in the next few seconds. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. Seven. We have a go for main engine start. Four, three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour on a voyage to view the universe. Houston now controlling. Roll program, Houston. Roger, roll, Endeavour. Roll maneuver underway aboard Endeavour. Vehicle's now in a heads down position on course for a 20, 28 and a half degree orbit. Endeavour's engines have now throttled down as the orbiter passes through the area of maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle in the lower atmosphere. Endeavour's already two miles downrange from the launch site, traveling more than 1,000 miles per hour. Endeavour Houston, go at throttle up. The three liquid-fueled engines are back at full throttle aboard Endeavour. At the one minute, 30 second mark, Endeavour is traveling 1,700 miles per hour. The altitude is 82,000 feet downrange from the launch site, 12 nautical miles. Standing by for burnout and separation of the twin solid rocket boosters. And SRB separation uh, is confirmed aboard Endeavour at the 2 minute 15 second mark. The vehicle is at an altitude of 178,000 feet, downrange from the launch site, 38 nautical miles. Endeavour is now traveling 4,500 feet per second, or 3,000 miles per hour. Performance nominal. Roger, performance is nominal. OTC GPS. Go ahead. Give you step 799 complete. Copy. GLS is go for 
GT LO2 pressurization. GLS is go for main engine start. All visible. Lift off confirmed. Copy. Roll program, Houston. Roger, roll, Endeavor. Flight guidance, we see good roll. Copy. Throttle up, three at 104. Endeavor, Houston, go at throttle up. Roger, go, Houston. Performance nominal. 103 converge. Endeavor Houston, performance nominal. Roger, performance is nominal. Two engine Ben Guerrier. Endeavor Houston, two engine Ben Guerrier. Two engine Ben. Negative return. Endeavor Houston, negative return. Roger that, Houston, negative return. Stand by for press to ATO, Mark. Endeavor Houston, press to ATO, select band jewel. Press to ATO, select band jewel.
So welcome to the mid-deck of the Space Shuttle Endeavour. This is where we spend a, a lot of our off-duty hours. You'll notice on the far wall, we have some sleep stations installed. This is very important for our flight. We have a crew of seven, and we're up 24 hours a day as we split ourselves into two shifts. The red team is asleep right now. The sleep stations provide them with the privacy they need to get a good night's rest. They'll be waking up in a few hours, coming on duty. The white containers that you see velcroed to the wall contain our personal hygiene kit. In the weightless environment, it's really important to have Velcro around. Otherwise, everything will float. The mid-deck also provides us with an opportunity to carry some smaller experiments. You're looking at two of them right now. One of them is sponsored by Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It's experiment and control systems theory. We're actually doing some work for a future space station that we're going to develop. The lower experiment is a protein crystal growth experiment, as are the two that I'm panning to right now. This is an ongoing research project that's flown on many shuttles. We found that we can grow more pure crystals when we're up in this weightless environment. Well, let's go see the rest of the shuttle. Oh, here's Tammy. She's taking a break from her work to get herself something to drink. She's actually over in an area that you could call the kitchen or the galley. She's got a means to dispense water so we can fill our drink bags and also rehydrate our food. Most of the food on board is freeze-dried, and some of it is what we call thermostabilized, where all we have to do is throw it into the small oven we also have on board. You can see on the controls on the right-hand side that we have a means of selecting the amount of water and whether or not we want hot or cold. We also have a small oven down below this rehydration station, which Tammy is getting into right now. I think she's going to pass up some food to Sam. He doesn't get an opportunity to come down much since the experiments and the telescopes keep him so busy. Uh, that's the only way to do it. Weightlessness is great. Oh, well, I guess Tammy's got to go back up to work. Here, let me give you a better view. Like I said, we have a means of filling up the freeze-dried packages we have on board and a means of heating them as well. And you can see some of the food that's velcroed to the wall.
This is Space Lab Operations Central. We're again seeing real-time video from uh, Endeavour from the uh, Hopkins Ultraviolet Telescope, uh, seeing the finder camera image as the telescope is now trained on uh, Jupiter and its moons. We're using two of the moons uh, as, as uh, so-called guide stars. Uh, those are the moons Europa and Ganymede, uh, which uh, the crosshairs are focused on. Uh, the actual uh, uh, moon Io, which is the subject of observation here, uh, would be showing should be showing up within the uh, crosshairs uh, right in the center of the screen on NASA TV. And of course, the large, uh, just white uh, disk about the size of a nickel is uh, Jupiter itself, the large red planet of our solar system. Down at the bottom of the screen, we can say that see that we're taking data uh, with the uh, Hopkins Telescope spectrometer uh, to. Uh, uh, try and measure uh, elements that are uh, showing up in the uh, ejection of material by volcano volcanoes on the moon Io. This real-time video downlight from the guidance system of the Hopkins Ultraviolet Telescope shows the globular cluster 47 Tucani, which is a primary target for uh, this orbit. The uh, stars are extremely numerous and, and quite bright. Ground operations teams are working with the on-orbit um, astronauts to uh, determine the precise pointing of the instruments and to make sure that they are targeted, locked onto the appropriate stars within this globular cluster. Astro Huntsville, we're go for line 41. Detector on. Huntsville, Astro. Go ahead. You should be getting uh, Whoopi video now. And we're seeing it. Thank you.
Okay, John, if uh, you see good act marks, item six to recenter. And then followed by an item, stand by one. And 3 CJN, Briggs Cheney Middle School. This is WA4SIR. Hi, Nick. Well, it's uh, good to hear you on the air here, and uh, we're ready to ready to uh, talk to you guys. Go ahead. Okay, I copy that now. Yeah, well, you know, when I was in the fourth grade, uh, the Mercury program was in full swing, and um, I used to watch the uh, Mercury launches uh, my teacher would bring a TV into school, and I would watch them all. And uh, I got really excited about it then, and I think uh, ever since then it was sort of in the back of my mind that flying in space is something that I really wanted to do. Oh, I think the human race could live on other planets. In fact, uh, I would very much like to... Uh, to see us uh, colonize Mars. I think Mars is a great, uh, great expansion area for us because it's, um, it's a little bit like the Earth in the way it's built and uh, could be uh, built into a planet that uh, humans could survive on pretty well, I think. Space Station Mirror, Space Station Mirror, this is the Space Shuttle Endeavor. How do you hear? Well, we hear you loud and clear. Go ahead. 
Dr. Seigert, I presume. Well, being the only real English-speaking person aboard, you assume correctly. I was wondering how your English was uh, by now, Normie, but it sounds like you haven't forgotten a thing. Well, how are you liking your new your new home there, Dr. Zaggart? We all settled in? It's not bad at all. It's uh, nice and roomy, and uh, places that are cool and places that are rather warm, so you can migrate to wherever is most comfortable. Is this to you? Yeah, it sure is. And uh, actually, the scenery around where I am, I've got uh, six other faces, but uh, it looks an awful lot like Discovery did back in 92, Norm. Well, you know, I figured if we were ever in orbit again, we'd probably be on the same spacecraft. I guess I was wrong. Well, it's kind of amazing. We've got uh, 13 human beings in orbit right now, and I think that um, you're just starting off on your big adventure, and we're about to end ours tomorrow. But I think the fact that we've got 13 humans on orbit uh, is, uh, is signaling that we've got a whole new horizon uh, just unfolding for us here with our joint space efforts. And uh, we're real happy for you. Well, I'm happy for you. I believe you've had a successful flight. Everyone on board asked me to pass along their best wishes to you. And uh, in the Russian tradition, we usually lay on the Miyake Pesetsky. Well, we sure appreciate the words. And uh, we've had just a great flight here. We've the orbiter's been working just great. We've gathered a lot of uh, ultraviolet data for the guys on the ground, and uh, we're hoping to come home tomorrow if the weather lets us, and if not, uh, we'll just be forced to spend an extra day on orbit.
Endeavor Houston, about a minute to LOS. We'll pick you up on the other side at 2125, and it looks like we have a view of uh, some sort of tropical cyclone sort of system out there in the Indian Ocean. There's a lot of serious blow off there. Yep, we certainly have some clouds out here, Mario, and uh, I guess we'll see you on the other side of the LOS. Catch you then. Go ahead, John. Yeah, the past few acquisitions, the uh, IPS has been pointing, you know, a little bit off, and uh, this one, as soon as we commanded the Astro Star Tracker, it was almost right on with uh, the star view display we have up here. We're seeing some amazing lightning from our downlink cameras, Endeavor. Yeah, it's even better with your eyeballs. Quite a picture with the lightning and the sunset. And we got city lights to the east, and I'm sure you're looking at it as well. That's an incredible view. We can see the Cape very clearly. Astro Huntsville for Ron. job. We've got an awful lot of observations and data. IPS performed fantastic. The Astro payload did too, as did the crew. I guess it's time to get close to stow our orbiting astrophysics laboratory. Yeah, 
I'm afraid it is. So we'll uh, press along with that, David. bit sad seeing this beautiful instrument go to the stowage position. Well, it's done a fine job for us, and we're real pleased to have been part of the mission, Dave. We have uh, tried to download camera A. I don't know if you have TV available. We've uh, put it up on camera A if you do. Affirmative. Thank you. We're getting a great image. Good morning, Tammy. Good morning, Dave. Endeavour now being uh, commanded into its first roll reversal. Uh, this is a maneuver to uh, bank the orbiter from left to right or vice versa uh, to uh, increase the drag during the entry, thus slowing the airspeed of the orbiter and uh, dissipating the proper energy uh, on the command of the onboard computers. Every Houston, we show you approaching the hack. No change to weather. The winds are 2-3-0 at 15 peak 22. That's three peak four from the right, 15 and peak 22 on the head. We would like a late drag chute deploy just in case we can get the crosswind DTO. Roger, Roger that, we copy. Endeavour is uh, traveling right now at a descent rate seven times steeper than that of a commercial jetliner as Oswald prepares to flare up the nose prior to landing. Pilot Bill Gregory has deployed the landing gear. Main gear touchdown. Nose gear touchdown. The drag chute has been deployed. Endeavour rolling out on runway 22 at Edwards Air Force Base to complete a shuttle record 6.9 million mile astronomy research flight.
stop, Houston. Copy, we'll stop, Endeavour. And welcome home, Endeavour, after a fantastic record-setting mission. It'll be a tough one to beat, and it sure is nice to have you all home. Well, it's nice to be here, Kurt. Okay, Houston, thanks a lot. Make Okay, plus landing Delta's flight. We'll stop, Houston. No Delta's flight. No. Copy, no. we'll stop, no Endeavour. And Eagle. welcome home, Endeavour, after a fantastic record-setting mission. It'll be a tough one to beat, and it sure is nice to have you all home. Max flight. Well, yeah, it's nice to be here, Kurt. Max. No Delta's. Copy. No immediate Delta's. He's got to pick up in the post landing. Endeavour, Houston, no post landing Delta's, and you're go to pick up in the post landing procedure. Okay, GNC flight. Flight GNC. Any other Delta's? Roger that. Negative. In the procedure. DPS. Endeavour Houston, you have a go for the hydraulic load test. Roger, and work. ET doors look good. <laughs> 